Hey everybody, and welcome to another Chew Stream. This one is extra special because I got an extra special guest on the stream. It is Justin Gobi Fields, creature designer, creature uh, conceptual artist, sculptor extraordinaire. He does everything. Let's welcome Justin to the stream. Hey, well, welcome Justin. What's going on, guys? Right on. So this was a very kind of uh, quick. I guess stream to put on, um, you know, thank you so much for taking the time out to actually sculpt something so we can play yeah. something, you know, and everybody can see your awesome sculpting abilities and all this stuff. This actually just started from a little sphere, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of my like conceptual creature sculpts just start from a sphere unless Unless I have time, uh, or there's an uh, like maybe almost like an archetype that the client wants to go with that I already kind of have ready, uh, and then I'll I'll just focus on the body shape and then detailing it out. Right on. And uh, by the way, Justin, you were just at the uh, Schoolism House uh, a few weeks ago. Um, Brandon and Noah, I just saw them on the stream. They want to say hi, hey, guys. <laughs> Right on. Um, actually, I forgot to mention, my awesome sidekick, Masei Seki, is on the line as well. Hey, guys. Hey, Justin. Hey, what's going on? Good. Right on. Um, I want to start off the conversation here, you know, with uh, what did you have in mind when you started this? Like, did you, how clear was it, you know, the the objective of this uh, creature? Oh, I'm... <laughs> Honestly, we've been playing a lot of uh, uh, Magic the Gathering in the office, so I was like, well, i got to do a dragon. So, <laughs> Awesome, awesome. So this is Magic the Gathering inspired? Right? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. Very cool. Uh, I believe, uh, like, I was just kind of sketching off of a concept. Uh, I want to quote the artist here so I don't get in trouble here. Let me find, let me find that information here. Carl Kopansky. Oh, yeah, I know him. I didn't even know that. Yeah, that, he was the original design, I guess, that uh, that I was sculpting off of the card, essentially. It's awesome. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And so there's no orthographic views or anything? You're just kind of going from the card? Just, yeah, just one image, really. No orthographic view. I'm just kind of... I'm. I was just sitting there looking at the image and just trying to interpretate, like, what what it would look like in 3D, in like a 3D space. Oh, that's awesome. It yeah. looks awesome. Um, now, the we have some questions. I'll go with the first question here. Okay, so the first question here is actually a question about the Toronto Workshop. So uh, Tim Walsh asks, will you be at the Toronto Workshop this year, Bobby, or will you be in Paris already? Actually, I will be in Paris, but I will fly back... For the Toronto workshop before I fly back to Paris. Uh, won't miss it for the world and I'll tell you why because I'll just tell you a few of the guests that are coming. It's actually very exciting for me. So um, number one is Shiyun Kim from Disney. He's gonna be there doing character design. Amazing. Super uh, big admirer of his work uh, as well. One of my artistic heroes, Stefan Martinier, is coming. That's going to be just mind-blowing. Awesome. Mind-blowing. Awesome. Mike Imada is coming. Production oh, yes. designer from Disney. Mike Imada is coming. That's yeah. going to be amazing. And uh, a whole bunch more. But yeah, that's going to be really exciting. And then also, Justin, you're going to be coming to uh, some workshops as well, right? At least one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I believe I am on the docket for Calgary. Yes, sir. Calgary. That's yeah. going to be so awesome. You're going to be sharing the stage with some big time <laughs> players there. So it's going to be great. Ryan Lang's going to be there. Craig love... Mullins is going to be there. Oh, I got Craig Mullins. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> Victoria Ying is going to be there. Awesome. Um, Tara Whitlatch. A legend. Mm -hmm. Legends. Legend. Legends and future legends. <laughs> nothing but nothing but the best. It's going to be amazing. And uh, 
Yeah, I don't say that lightly because I really see your work and what you do as being at the forefront of uh, concept art and you oh, know the the evolution of it. Absolutely. Yeah, um, it's definitely gotten more more three D heavy, and it's just it's one of those things where um, it, it's you know coming from you know I used to do restaurant menus for God's sakes, you know what I mean? Like jumping, jumping into ZBrush was extremely daunting, but it's the same feeling you had when you opened Photoshop for the first time. You know, you just don't know where things are, and it's actually, it's a lot easier than it looks to get involved, or jump in and start creating stuff. How long uh, did it take you to, like, how many sculpts did it did you do until you were like, yeah, this is starting to look like something? Um, I think... So, I think I still have that image. I'll I'll send that to you so you can post it. And oh, it was that'd be great. First attempt at uh, doing something in ZBrush, and I don't even think it was ZBrush. I think it was Sculptress, and that is a free program that ZBrush puts out that, that pretty much is gets you addicted like crack. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking Sculpt- that actually. That's funny. Yeah, yeah, they're they're my pusher for sure. Uh, but. Uh, no, uh, it, it took me a little bit to wrap my head around the process of, of doing stuff like that for um, for illustration, like how to uh, like just paint on top of 3D, what, what's the benefits, um, and and uh, and that stuff. But you know, I could spend an entire day on sculpting something, and I could render it out from any angle the follow every day of the week. You know what I mean? Like, and just to really show off the design or multiple designs that way. And um, while still providing an asset that I could possibly give to a VFX house uh, to, you know, it, it's not going to work right out the gate, but it definitely gives them uh, a huge head start on, on sculpting something like that or, or doing a, a model for production. And that's why, uh, you know, that's a huge part of why I feel that you are on that forefront of the concept art, you know, movement or profession or whatever you want to call it because you've really started to combine a lot of stuff together right like you are already modeling a concept which is mind-blowing and a little scary you know being in my position of like I'm the painter (laughs) and then I gotta send it to somebody to sculpt it and now you're taking my job so that's really no no, but you know what that (laughs) that is kind of like the truth so you know, I'm cool with that because, hey, you can't fight technology. You can't fight the giant wave of evolution. The smarter people just learn how to surf. That's true. That's right? true. It's very true. I mean, it's it's one of those things where, you know, I was just, I was just in a discussion the other day with someone where uh, we were kind of speaking about, like, how it's kind of – it's very sad that some of the practical stuff is kind of falling by the wayside – and that practical sculptors don't can't find work these days, and it's and it's like, well, you you have to understand, especially in the art field, um, when it comes to a field that is heavily uh, embedded with technology. At the same time, you know, like the more traditional uh, ways of doing things will get pushed under the fold, but there's no reason. You can't use all that knowledge that you've gained over the last 20 years as a sculptor and apply it to something in, in ZBrush. You know, um, it, it's it's just like, you know, what, what Pixar did when, you know, Disney pretty much let go a bunch of 2D artists and Pixar was like, that's the wrong way to do it. Let's train them in 3D. And then, you know, look what happened. So, you know, it it's understanding that especially in the entertainment field, you will always be learning something new. You can't, you can't not really. Um, there's so many programs that I want to dive into right now. I just don't have the time. Uh, but you know, I'm really looking forward to diving into doing some more moto work. Um, you know, how I'd really want to know how to uh, essentially digitally project uh, some of the matte paintings that I've done in the past. You know, that kind of stuff. Usually, I just hand it off. Um, but uh, I just want to know how that works, so I know the pipeline through and through, and it makes me makes me more more valuable. I get to stay in the pipeline longer. And you, you know, like um, just so people know, like you have been nothing but adding more and more value to your services and your studio because, um, 
like we were having discussions in when I was over at your studio uh, a few weeks ago, mm-hmm. just talking about how you know if you have your three D printer going on as well, like you could be a one stop shop. Yeah, absolutely. We're 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 setting ourselves up to be the one stop shop. Uh, and when I, if you so, could just let everybody know what that really means by a one stop shop. So I mean. A lot of uh, a lot of the designers that are here in house, and even the ones that we are, are using uh, abroad, uh, we we're all using ZBrush to kind of uh, do our concepts and whatnot. So, you know, with very little effort, these things can be printed out, you know, overnight. And say in a meeting, instead of just looking at an, an image, uh, your client or director can hold these creatures in his hands. He can see what it's going to look like under certain lighting and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And it makes no sense to me why, with a lot of these films that are going on, that you would spend so much time and money on a model and not use that exact same model to produce toys or collectibles or, you know, and if it's, if it's all coming off of a concept model, why would it even leave that house? You know what I mean? Like, it makes no sense that you would have to give it to someone else to remodel it or or or, or uh, you know, retopple it for production when we have those artists here at the same time. So if that artist ever has a question, he doesn't have to wait on an email from me. He can just come into my office and go, "Hey, what what were you trying to do with this?" Mm-hmm. And I can just be like, "Oh yeah, I don't I don't know." But no. <laughs> the other really powerful thing that you said to me was like, uh, "Say it was a gun, right? Say." Uh, say, you know, let's just say they're stormtrooper guns, right? Mm-hmm. You have like the 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 ones that are really close to the camera, which mm-hmm. maybe they need to be made out of metal and things like that. But then all the background characters could be holding, uh, you know, three D printed guns that you printed mm-hmm. out, you colored, you know, you painted and everything, and it goes from concept straight to actual prop. Which yeah, is I mean, mind you blowing. Do that, yeah, you could do that all under one roof, and we can do it here. Um, you know, we we have experienced uh, people here in house that have been, you know, master mold makers for the last fifteen years. Um, you know, all the talent that we have under Ironclad's roof right now. I mean, like it's pretty, it's pretty insane considering um you know like what how how far it's come in in such a little bit of time you know uh i mean like technically we were you know we've been open for almost three years now and we're an emmy nominated oscar nominated studio with all the with all the super talented artists that come through here um we can say that we've we've legitimately touched uh or worked on some of the world's most famous franchises it's awesome so yeah, so, so cool. It's a dream. It's a dream come true, to be honest with you. And uh, let's go on to the next question because the next question actually kind of relates to Ironclad. Okay. Um, this is from a familiar name. This is from Noah from Israel. <laughs> Hi, Noah. <laughs> right. So Noah says, uh, setting up a studio. What's the most essential to you? And uh, what are your quote unquote nice to haves? Nice to have. Um, you got honestly, so many nice to have. <laughs> so many nice to haves. You know, um, I, I'm I'm super thankful for the amount of, of reference that I've I've kind of collected over the years. Um, it, I kind of got addicted to uh, buying art books when I was going to school at Noman, uh, and uh, ever since then I've just you know, well you've seen the studio. There's a lot a lot of books in here. Um, but reference is always awesome, but hands down, out of anything that, that I would want in a studio is passionate people. I, I would rather have passionate people any day of the week, you know, uh, sitting in here designing, uh, people having fun. I think the, 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 the success of Ironclad is completely dependent upon all the artists that have, that have come along with us for this ride so far. Absolutely. Awesome. Um... For me, uh, setting up a studio, what's the most essential things for me would definitely be uh, somebody Besides, that will handle the business side of things. Yes. Right? Yeah. I think you're big on that as well, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, for the first two years, you know, it was ran, um, we didn't know any better, you know. 
we put people in charge of things that ultimately had no idea what they were doing, which caused issues and drama and all that kind of stuff. But uh, you will always hit those hiccups because, you know, starting your own studio, starting your own business is scary enough. Just being a freelancer is already another level of scary, you know. You know, you know, you're really just hoping from month to month that people call you for work. Uh, so it's already a, an insane amount of stress. So if you're not a business person or if you're not a finance guy, I can't stress enough. Um, find someone that can do that for you because you're you you cannot wear that many hats for that long. It's just, you know, you'll you'll hate what you do before you know it, and you just don't want to do that. That is definitely the best scenario, but uh, let's also talk about probably, you know, like <laughs> the other scenario where you can't find any business person and stuff like <laughs> that. What, what would be like your essentials that you would want to advise people out there if they're starting by themselves? What's the essentials? Research all the fees. <laughs> all these start your business and be legal because it's going to cause so much trouble for you down the road, you know. Um, you, legal I mean, as in uh, being incorporated? Is that what you mean? Or, or you know, just having, you know, even paying an accountant to do um, your taxes and, and uh, finding a good CPA is pretty a, a strong thing. That was a rough lesson that we had to learn in year one that we thought we could do it ourselves. And, you know, day four of trying to figure out taxes, you're just like, I just want to sculpt something. I don't want to do this anymore. You oh, know? totally. I remember yeah. uh, being audited uh, a few years ago, Oof. and that was really, you know, stressful. Even yeah. though we weren't doing anything wrong, it was just like, okay, we need to be really organized a lot more. Like, I already thought we were organized, but we needed to be even more organized but hey every uh bump in the road is uh is a lesson Mm -hmm. and molds you i feel like since you guys hit these bumps it's now you're more aware of it and you learn from it so you know you just take a different route just to avoid these so i think it's a good thing that you guys went through all of this yeah totally it's like your uh bloody knuckles masse it's like (laughs) you know you, you you got punching or whatever it is you were doing till your knuckles are so bloody and now they're even stronger yeah. <laughs> it's the scars that make me yeah. i mean you know you always learn the right way and you have nice way. hands by the way i just oh. <laughs> Thank you. i don't want people to think that they're all scabby and weird and... there you go well now they do <laughs> uh cool so next question is uh do you imagine or envision a personality for your sculpts? And if yes, when in the process does the personality emerge? Yeah, that's a good question because uh, generally you start off in a very kind of neutral, symmetrical pose, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it all depends. So it, it all depends on what the brief is. If it's a humanoid, then I have a humanoid base that I can start from with all different kind of body types that we've created over the years. Um. So if it's if it's a creature or a monster or an alien or anything like that, you know, um, I usually try and figure out like what am I going for? Like, what's the archetype? Is it a, is it a, is he a thief? Is he a soldier? Is he you know is he a, a scoundrel? You know that those kinds of things definitely add in putting a lot of character in these creatures that I that uh, I create. Um, I'm usually either watching or listening to music that is inspiring or that reminds me of a certain character archetype. Um, And I'll, you know, I'll put a little bit of flair in there. If, if there's, there's something that draws attention to a specific archetype. um, I try to hit that home to where I don't need to describe to you what the character is. You just know what kind of character he is just by looking at him. Um, and it, it's 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 really strange. Like I, I gather a lot of reference. I'll have, you know, a full screen of reference, and maybe even a, a movie of something that I'm, I'm inspired by uh, going on in the background. And that's usually how I start most of my sculpts. Now, usually uh, when I'm doing a concept, I will put that creature, that character, into uh, into a moment of the script. Mm-hmm. 
do you do that as well? Um, sometimes. Uh, it's strange. Uh, only until, I'd say just about recently, um, have we been getting scripts and being allowed to even read the script. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for the longest time, I, I was fighting just to read the script, just to make sure that they would let us, they would trust us enough to send it to us. Because there's a lot of information in there that we can put into the character if we know it. Um, but sometimes, you know, some some producers or some directors, they want to just see you just create something. Um, and then maybe they can figure out if they can use it or not. I don't know. It's that's, That seems to be working backwards for me. Like, I'd rather know what kind of archetype I'm, I'm trying to, to create or what's the motivation behind a character uh, as I'm sculpting than yeah. try, try, <laughs> trying to figure it out when I, you know, watching the movie in the theater and I'm like, oh, oh, that's where this was going. Oh, okay, I get it now, you know. But, it does sound cr- like really backwards. It you does. Know? Like it, just kind of fishing in the dark when you don't have a script. Yeah. Um, one of my, or two of my, like most kind of despised words or maybe not despised, but just irks me is just when um, they go, Okay, yeah, here's a character, his name is blah, blah, blah. It's Blue Sky. You know, Blue yeah. Sky, just do whatever. <laughs> That's like the worst description. I hate hearing it. I don't know about you, but... It, yeah. it, 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 it's scary, right? Because I'd rather have... I'd rather have uh, a little bit more of rules to jump into Blue Sky than just that. Um... Because it's it's always scary as a freelancer, right, or or as a studio owner, is you're just like, well, you know, if they don't like this initial one, they're not going to come back. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So it's it's it's. I think the 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 way we stop that as an industry is just explaining. You know what I mean? I think the key is, you know, making sure that they understand the expectations of what you're doing and and how you're doing it. Blue sky is fine with very little brief, but they have to understand that that you're just filling out ideas and that they, that you, you know, you should at least give, give them at least like two weeks to figure out something. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, you know, clients out here, they, you know, sometimes they want them yesterday, you know, uh, and you don't have very, you don't have a lot of time to explain your, your design or even get, get to the nitty gritty or really fully visually show what you were thinking of. But uh, you just got to do, you got to roll with the punches, you know. Right on. And the next question is definitely a a good one for you as well. Uh, KJP asks, uh, I want to work as a concept artist in a video game studio, but I just graduated from a 3D school. Do you think I should include 3D into my portfolios? If you want, if he wants to be a a concept artist? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um... But I think that a strong 2D foundation is going to go a long way with your with using 3D as concept. Well, if anybody looks through your portfolio, they can also see a lot of uh, illustrations that you do that's you know mixed with sculpture. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, right. Definitely. So that could be a really good route that uh, KJP could go down. Is yeah, kind of like show those yeah his 3D work, except mix it with illustration right paint on top of it and things like that absolutely i i would say that there isn't a single marketing image that isn't 3d like every ad that you see every poster or you know there's 3d elements or there's assets in there that, that were painted on top of um i mean not just concept art but like using using 3d in the concept art field is definitely going to help you and uh, help you stay in the pipeline longer. However, you know, knowing 3D as a freelance artist, it also opens up more work for you to do venue-wise. Um, but it all depends on what you're going after. You know, if, if you just want to do you know, do concept art and concept art only, then that's what you're going to have to do. Now, the next question here. If we could go on to the next question. The next question is from Fluff. Fluff says, uh, I feel my... It's so funny saying these uh, funny handles. Anyways, uh, 
I feel that my ability to visualize and capture shape and value is lackluster. Is there any exercises to improve these areas? Also, as a creature designer, what's your favorite animal? So maybe we could go to the first one. Do you, do you have any exercises that you do to strengthen your ability to visualize? Yeah, um, I, I'm a huge believer in sketching and alchemy. Uh, what was that? Sorry? Sketching with alchemy. Alchemy is a free program. Uh, it's a vector program that allows you to kind of sketch in symmetry so you can come up with some really, really cool vector silhouettes. And then uh, I'll do exercises where I literally just try and, and design something out of those shapes, uh, which, which usually helps strengthen a lot of my... Um, I guess Viscom, you know. Uh, and... yeah, that's really sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no you're right. Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, um, yeah, that's that's really cool because the way that you're kind of doing things, and correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, it's kind of like putting together abstract shapes, ab- abstract combinations, and trying to visualize something through those shapes. Yes. Right. right? Uh, I do things. Uh, completely different. I just stare at blank, you know, stuff like a blank wall, or <laughs> turn off my monitor and I, I just stare at it and try to visualize that thing. Yeah. Right. And and once I do visualize that thing, then I start sketching it out. Yeah. So two very different ways of approaching it. In Pinterest, oh my god, I'll just I'll just look at Pinterest of whatever you know. If I'm if I'm looking at robots. I'll just look at, you know, all kinds of industrial machinery and looking at that kind of stuff or or just getting inspired by even looking at stuff like on, on ArtStation, you know, like you'll just be like, ooh, that looks fun. Like you like I a lot of the, the times uh I'll just be like, Ooh, look, that guy really did an awesome piece and like I, I wanna do something like that or I wanna I wanna test my skills or I haven't done product design in a while, so let's design a lightsaber or, you know, like that kind of stuff. You know, it really, I, I love the the fluidity of the community and, and seeing all the different ways to be inspired and, and all the different ways people are creating these days. It's awesome. And, you know, uh, another thing that I think really helps us, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're still kids at heart. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right, and that's a big part of it. Like, if you're just thinking, this is my 9-to-5 job, I'm going to the factory, and I'm going to, you know, churn out, help to churn out a movie with all the other workers, probably won't be the best movie. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's, never, it's never fun when you, when you take on a job and you're realizing that you're like, oh, man, I, I kind of don't, I kind of don't want to do this one. Um and there's but, enough people out there already in the industry where they take it like that. Like, okay, this is a business, you know, we're counting the beans and you got to make sure that it's under budget and all this stuff. And there's plenty of those kind of people, right? Where the creative people stay like kids and just have fun with it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I think that a lot of the the, the way... The, the the studio came about was honestly was I was you know uh, for lack of a better word I, w- I was tired of not being listened to you know um, I was like no I think that you could go this route or I think you could do this thing and you know when a lot of the concepts and stuff uh, that I was doing early on were starting to get chosen and doing that kind of stuff and you know working on Goosebumps with Neville and Carlos Wante I definitely realized you know, that uh, as an artist, my opinion matters, you know. I, I, I didn't want to just be a cog in the wheel. I wanted to be, you know, uh, in the room help making the decisions to help design the whole film or um, design the whole look of, the, of a creature and, and whatnot. So uh, that was a big part of me was I wanted to be able to art direct. I wanted to be able to find new talent and work with new and exciting artists and that was really the uh, original idea behind uh, behind creating Ironclad that was the same reason I want to start my own studio you know uh, 
The I universe brought us together, Bobby. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, I don't know about you, but for me, like when I was growing up until like my early 20s, I thought I had a problem. Like I, I thought I probably do have problems, but the problem I th <laughs> thought I had back then was the fact that um, I couldn't stay at a job too long. I just couldn't. Like, I would just want to yeah. quit. I just want to leave or whatever it was. And and uh, later on, I started to read up on all these different entrepreneurs, uh, serial entrepreneurs, and all these people that built their own business. And that was a huge trait that they all had, that they all thought that they were kind of messed up and they couldn't stay at, uh, you know, working at one job for too long. Um yeah, I don't know if you had any of that kind of thing going on. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it, it's it was one of those things where you know I, I was really just following someone else around because I was I had no idea what I wanted to do. You know, I was in a I think uh, when I first applied to go to Noman, I was in a relationship where, you know, uh, she was in school and I was just kind of there and I was trying to uh, trying to help pay the bills, but I was absolutely miserable doing so and, and I hated it. Um, not contributing, but I just, I just hated the work that I was doing. And um, that takes its toll on you after a while. It really, really does. And if you don't have a creative outlet, you know, I, I don't even, I don't understand how people that aren't creative don't have any other outlet, you know what I mean? But then I, I realized that our job is, as creatives is to provide that outlet for everybody else, yeah, whether it's video games or movies or stuff like that. And, and I abs the more and more I think about it that way, the more and more I love my job. Yeah, and now that you know we both run our own studios and everything, it definitely became this huge focus for me to constantly stir up the pot a little bit so um so people don't get bored yeah you know what right. i mean because i feel like that was a huge reason why i couldn't stay at a job that long is just because once the learning stopped then uh, you know it's i got really bored yeah um so i don't know if you do any of that kind of thing with your own studio to you know keep everybody stimulated or i don't know yeah um, I mean, we, we try to go to, like, movies as a group a lot, um, which is always fun. Um, we're, we're getting getting ready to possibly start doing our own kind of uh, IP generation uh, here within the studio. And, right and I think that's going to be a really fun, you know, uh, push in the right direction. Um, but, yeah, it's like, you know, we're starting to kind of level out. We're, we're, we're getting more and more clients. Um and it, it's honestly, it's a super exciting time here, and I can't wait to see what happens next out here. I think uh, definitely the growth of your studio that plays a big part about like you know people want to stay there, right? Like, oh yeah, you can feel the momentum and everything. And that's definitely exciting. Uh, and actually, looking back in hindsight, the projects I was working on, at you know, for other people when I didn't have my studio. That was probably the biggest reason, because <laughs> like those <laughs> cartoons, I just didn't like them. You know, I remember working on Rescue Heroes for all of you out there that might have watched Rescue Heroes back in the day. I drew the backgrounds for a little bit. Oh, I, cool! I didn't know that. Oh, you didn't? <laughs> yeah. Oh my God! Did you used to watch Rescue Heroes? No, I did, but I, I oh, like, you know what it is? Catch a glimpse of it whenever I flip through the channel and be like. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Justin, do you know what Rescue Heroes is? Oh, yeah, yeah. My nephews love that stuff. Oh, man. Well, yeah, for those of you that don't know, it was like the most politically correct action show or whatever because there were no bad guys. It was just like uh, natural disasters. <laughs> it's <was> like, <laughs> oh, let's go and fight that fire or whatever it might be. Um, but, yeah, the most – I'll tell you, like, the most frustrating point was uh, – I was there, I was trying to create stuff for my portfolio. And so I really wanted to kick some butt on a location design. So I spent a good amount of time on it and all this stuff. And then I gave it to the person and the guy was like, 
Okay, put a piece of paper over top of it and draw all this out in an hour, right? An hour and a half or whatever, <laughs> and then hand that in. I, I was like, well, I can't fit in all the details. I can't, you know, make everything precise. And he's like, exactly. This doesn't go with any of the other backgrounds, <laughs> you know, in the show. And I was like, man, screw this. I don't want to be here. You just, your dreams. He was just like, yeah, this looks great, but we can't use it. Just Not shut you down. Up. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure that uh, that person at that time was feeling like, oh, man, I hate to tell you this, but, yeah. you know, yeah. didn't want that to happen. But uh, it made sense. It didn't fit in with uh, the other backgrounds. Um, yeah. Let's go on to the next question here. So the next question says, oh, also, we forgot to answer, what's your favorite animal? being a creature designer what's your favorite animal my favorite animal ooh um besides dinosaurs i'd say dogs <laughs> oh yeah you're a very big dog person i'm a big dog guy <laughs> for sure awesome um still at 4 i'm not getting any more no more dogs 4 is enough 4 is a lot dude you got 4, four big three, dogs too yeah 4 is 3 too many <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite animal, Miss A? Um, I like m mice, actually. Really? <laughs> yeah, I've always wanted to own one, but I always hear that they're like really smelly. Really smart. Or oh, okay. Smelly. Oh, so they're smart. <laughs> like I've actually wanted. A, I've always wanted a rat, a, a rat as a pet as well. But then I hear like, you know, it smells when they have to go to the washroom and just like oh. taking care of them is. Well, yeah. pretty much every animal, you know, yeah, when they go to right? the washroom, it doesn't smell like flowers. <laughs> no. No. No, <laughs> Especially no, no, no. Uh, pit bulls, as Justin probably could tell you, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> they have they have gas powerful enough that literally clears the studio. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to find out. <laughs> People will take breaks the, the moment one gets, uh, you know, when a bomb gets dropped. <laughs> They're just like, oh, God. <laughs> yeah, I like I like too many animals, but uh, I guess if I had to pick one it, right now, today, it would be the chameleon, usually. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the symbol of Imaginism Studios and schoolism, you know, and uh, they can change colors. That's really cool. And their eyes move independently, which is also really neat. Um all right, let's go on to the next question. So the next question says, this from Mark's everywhere, and he says, uh, or if it's a she, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> how has drawing informed your sculpting and vice versa? Oh, good one. Uh, so drawing for me, like I used to sketch a lot more than I do now. Uh, now I'm just kind of sketching in 3D. But when I went back to school, um, I'd, I'd always wanted to be a comic book artist for the longest time. And so a lot of my style is very, I guess, very comic book-ish, you know? Um, but when I got to take some actual traditional sculpting classes, like where I actually got to play with clay and be hands-on, then, then I, immediately I was in, um, you know, in, into, into ZBrush, and it just felt like that. This is what I'm. This is my medium to, that I want to work in. This is what I want to do. You know. Um, so a lot of my sculpting uh, uh, is based on pretty much just, I guess, what I could do, or just carving into a drawing, just like I would sketch, or um, I'd do a really rough, you know, layout, and then I would erase and, and cut into the silhouette and stuff like that. So it, it was, it was almost a no-brainer for me to go from drawing into sculpting, or from drawing into traditional sculpting and then into digital sculpting. Um, I wish I could do more of the traditional, but I just simply, I, you know, I don't have the time and the digital is just faster for me. I just picked it up um, faster than I did the traditional stuff, I guess. But, uh, you know, working in, in houses like ADI or Studio ADI all the time, you got to go out there and see your your digital creations become actual animatronic creatures or um you know masks or or costumes and that was always uh once i was there i knew you know and worked with uh awesome people like um 
uh, Tom and Alec over there at Studio ADI. Uh, those guys, I, I just fell in love with my job all over again. I was already in love with it. And then, like, getting to be there and being around all the movie props and, and all the movie magic, it, it still, to this day, completely and utterly inspires me. Okay, um, so out of just it doesn't have to be the most memorable the most awesome whatever moment but just pick one out of your hat like going somewhere seeing these props seeing the stuff give us a a good story of a good moment where you know that happens oh man oh to pick one i'd say that uh you know it's a it's a toss-up tie between uh, visiting Legacy Effects or visiting um, ILM. Whenever, whenever I get a chance to walk into ILM or uh, or Legacy, uh, you just become a kid again. So your very first time or your most memorable kind of time that you could talk about, I, I would probably say your very first time because then you could probably talk about that stuff that you saw. Yeah, um, I'd say I'd say that would be ADI. Going, going, going to work at uh, Algamated uh, Dynamics with, with the guys that make uh, a lot of the Predator and Alien costumes, um, and you know, just being in in that realm and and in that environment, you know, hands down they've got one of the coolest showrooms ever, ever. And and the when you work there uh, as a designer, you get to design, you get to sit in the showroom and design. So you're just it's wall to wall, life size predators, life size aliens. You know, you've got Scooby Doo, you've got Beast from X Men. You know, you've got Doc Ock arms coming out of the ceiling. It's just, it's, it's like the world's greatest sandbox. That's awesome. It must be kind of creepy though. Sometimes, you know, if you're doing overtime by yourself. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. At night, <laughs> it's. Uh, I don't know. It, I kind of dig it. You know, like I, I grew up. Watching, you know, all of Stan Winston's creations and 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 seeing all that kind of stuff, and I, I mean, I knew a little bit about the movie industry, but nothing like I do now, um, and and how things come together, and you know, that kind of environment, like it didn't creep me out. There was, you know, fake torn arms hanging on the wall for props, you know, and stuff like that. It never really bothered me. Um, it was just really cool and interesting to see how creative people can get and with with whatever they with, with whatever material they have on hand that is such a good opportunity to uh play some really good pranks oh yeah <laughs> you know yeah. late at night dress up oh, as okay. a predator <laughs> um so here's a question from hannah and she's she's from france or he's from France, or, you know, he or she. Uh, <laughs> it is complicated to be, or is it complicated to become a freelancer? Paperwork, working alone, professional link, taxes, work with other people from other countries, etc. How do you handle it? Thank you. How do you handle it? Um, well, I'm still trying to figure that out. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I could definitely, you know, tell you how we handle stuff from Canada you know there's certain forms certain uh, ID numbers for your business that you wouldn't have if you're outside the country it hasn't been a problem it's just you got to know what forms you have in your country you know what numbers to have in your country for your corporation uh, besides that definitely the professional link thing can be difficult you know like we travel all the time we go to california probably like at least like four times a year uh so that's not really a problem for us but um i can definitely see how that could be a problem and and i was just talking with the uh the in-house workshop students today uh earlier today uh, and they were talking about the same thing and i was just saying you know something that I do consciously that I did consciously from the very beginning was I said, we'll squirrel away 10% of our earnings to spend on going to places, learning from people, that kind of thing, because that always comes back to you, you know, three or four X. Oh yeah. So that's, that's really helped. 
I don't know, yeah. but do you have any uh, insight that you want There's to share? There's a social side that you have to you have to be aware of, and it's really hard for a lot of the other amazing, super talented artists that are you know in other parts of the world. You know, uh, LA is is very much. Uh, you have to be here in order to get work. Uh, whereas, you know, even though it's it's never been easier for people to work from home, especially artists, uh, you, people still like to have those one-on-one -on -one meetings. They, they like to know who they're sending money to. They like to know the talent. They like to know what kind of person they are. Um, so going to events like schoolism, meeting your fellow artists, meeting other professionals, that has definitely been uh, almost like a, uh, a day one staple for us at Ironclad, you know. Um, it started with going to THU all the time, and then, you know, now there's IFCC that we get, we get to go to, and um, it, it's just, it's never been a better time to meet other artists and find out what works for you, uh, and it's it's a tough call when it comes to that kind of stuff. As far as learning how to navigate the the financial waters, you know, and the legalities of everything, you know, you do have to do a lot of research. Be, be prepared to not be doing art for half the week in the beginning, you know. Once you know the rules and, and you know everything that you have to do, you know, it's it's one of those things where you just get used to it. And you get faster at it, and you get, you get more knowledgeable about it. And if you're lucky enough, you know, you get to a point where, you know, you can almost hire someone or bring someone on board into the studio that can handle that for you and let you get back to being a creative, which is what the studio was founded on to begin with, you know. And there's many different ways to go about doing what, you know, freelance from another country and starting a studio for for that matter but mm -hmm. i think the main thing that i would advise everybody especially people that want to start their own studio is that you got to keep learning you you got to gobble up those books you know especially if you never went to business school um i never i went to business school for a year so eh it's okay uh but a lot more than that was, uh, you know, my, my dad owned his own business for many years. Mm -hmm. So he taught me tons and tons and tons ever since I was a little tiny kid. Yeah. So, you know, if you didn't have that kind of background, that kind of exposure, man, I would hit those books a lot. You know, books about marketing, books about organization, books about business. Um, yeah. I would heavily gobble those up, and if you don't have time, do audiobooks. Yeah, you got me. You got me hooked on doing audiobooks now. Oh, awesome! Right on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've listened to like four in the last week, and it's super awesome. It's such an easy way to just constantly be learning other things or getting inspired by whether whether it's you know you just want to listen to your favorite story or you want to listen to how other people do business or any kinds of those kinds of books. Um, you give me know, some. Uh, give me some books. What, what kind of? What are your like? You know, your the books that you really like right now. Uh, I like. So I have them right here. Actually, I have. Uh, there's like manager day to day, uh, hundred dollar startup, and uh, my current book that I'm reading right now, in between uh, a hero with a thousand faces, and uh, nothing to lose, everything to gain. I really love that stuff. Awesome. Oh, and Kevin Smith's book. Oh, which one's that? Uh, I think I'm uh, the one I'm reading right now. Oh man, I just forgot the title of the book. Uh, I remember. Oh, uh, it's, it's like a, a something about a, a fat, lazy slob that did good. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. I liked um, what's that other one? Tough shit by Kevin yeah, yeah. Smith. That one's awesome. That's a great one. That one's yeah. a really good one too. He's definitely an idol of mine. I'd love to. I'd love to meet him and work with him on something. Although I don't know what it would be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the one that I'm listening to now has been really good, even though it sounds so cheesy. I'm telling you, it's like there's golden nuggets. 
and you'll laugh at me when I tell you the title. It's called Celebrating Partnership, <laughs> which sound the, the cover is even worse. It's just like so cheesy. But um, the thing about that is, you know, I grew up in a family where I have a brother. I didn't have any sisters. It's just my mom. She was the only female figure kind of thing. So the way that I am used to communicating and talking with people, like I'm very you know, very good and easy to talk with guys. Mm. To understand and to, you know, talk with girls was the thing that I have been learning more and more about. And and that book has really helped me and also helped me to figure out why I do the stupid things that I do or, you know, just things. <laughs> things, man. It's it's oh, yeah. so awesome. I would highly recommend it to anybody. Yeah, I just I just wrote it down. I put a star next to it. Yeah, and uh, podcast, you know, last last year is all about Tim Ferriss, uh, the Tim Ferriss show. But, oh. you know, I've, I've totally dropped off of that. I might go back. But the big one that I'm listening to now is Mike Dillard, his podcast called Self Made Man, which is brilliant. So good. I'm telling you. I'll check that one out for sure, yeah. Yeah, and for those of you that don't care about uh, improving yourself, <laughs> then <laughs> I would say Hardcore History is my go-to podcast. So good, especially the whole series about the the cons, uh, mm -hmm. Genghis Khan and and uh, his disciples and all that stuff. Fantastic. Yeah, he did some crazy stuff. Back yeah, then. yeah, you you I listen to that. I listened to part of it. Yeah. It makes uh, Hitler seem like a schoolyard bully, really. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, Anyways, okay. Yeah, I think there's a any any of the ones that are just you know about doing stuff, uh, create for just being a creative, you know, uh, and and listening how other creatives tackle day to day issues. I love those kinds of books, you know, or um, uh. There's a, I think there's a creative workshop book that's like, uh, I think Ash Thorpe posted it recently that was really good. Um, I picked that one up, and it's like 80 challenges to sharpen your design skills. That's a really good one, too. Um, there's just so many books. There's so many. <laughs> so many. I can't tell you. There's, there's, I, I feel terrible because there's there'll be times where I'll buy, I'll go on a book spree, and I'll only read one of them, and then the rest of them just kind of sit there, and I'm just like, oh, yeah, I forget that those are there. But uh, I'm really trying to make it a, a more of a habit these days to to read more and not just consume, consume, you know, Facebook. Uh, no, totally. What's your like? Do you have a structured uh, schedule that you really you know go by? I should. <laughs> <laughs> I should. Uh, well, so it's it's been kind of crazy, right? So over the last year, we kind of went into a way of doing things. Um, but, uh, you know, we recently uh, brought in, uh, you know, a new uh, partner and investor. And um, that has been an amazing experience so far and super awesome. And it's like, we're, we're definitely switching gears of how we use, like how we've been doing things for like the last two years, you know, come to find out it's pretty much wrong. <laughs> it's pretty much wrong. Uh, but I mean, you know, what was like the biggest thing was maybe some people can take something away from this. Um, just, just how we had, you know, the taxes structured, you know, um, we were, we were doing things wrong in that regard. And, and when we found out, you know, we luckily we found out before it got too crazy, but, uh, now we're in a better predicament to where, you know, um, we're just being handled better. You know, we actually have people in house now that are in charge of all that stuff. And I don't have to think about it anymore. I can just sit in here and sculpt and, and work with clients and, 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 and figure out what we want to do, uh, as, with internal projects and what we're, what we're currently tackling, you know, in the, the VR space right now, that'll be fun. Um, but, uh, you know, all that plus creating our own IPs plus managing other artists, uh, it's, 
it's it's a lot of fun, and I wish I had at least ten more hours in the day. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um... I really, I, some some days it feels like I, I didn't do anything, but uh, I, I actually did do a lot. It's just coming from the artist standpoint, where if you don't have an image to show by the end of the day, you feel like you haven't done anything at all, right? <sighs> <laughs> Nail on the head of that one. Well, you know, uh, these days, schoolism has just... It's just growing so rapidly and at such a... Such a pace that... um, You know, a lot more of my day has been taken up with uh, meetings and things like that. Or else things would just crumble around me. Uh, But I have switched up my schedule recently. um, Which... So far, it's been working pretty darn good. So, first thing I'm trying to do is eliminate emails. I know that sounds daunting and stuff, but uh, I'm trying to do a new thing where I I don't I only email in the morning, and I'm on the East Coast, so that means all the people on the West Coast will not reply right back to me in an instant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then that's it. I don't check emails anymore. And so what I'm going to do uh, once I get once I get somebody to check over my emails and stuff is uh, is I'm just going to have that person let me know if there's an important email that I need to respond to right away. Yeah. Otherwise, everything, I will respond to it in the morning. And uh, I feel like when I write emails in the morning, they go faster. Yeah. You, you, well, you just you, you know that once you get that kind of cleared and taken care of that you can get to doing the fun stuff. Yeah, another really good thing is like I know that once I get into work, because I, I just reply to emails uh, in the very morning before I even get to work, right? Once I leave for work, I know that I'm not going to be replying to emails anymore. Yeah. So that forces you to go, okay, let's get productive. Let's answer all these emails before we leave for the studio. And it's working out pretty good so far? So far, so good. I'm telling you, emails, oh my gosh. You think that they're productive, but when you really think about it, so much time is wasted in emails. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I I can, let me look at my phone here. It's terrible. Watch, you're going to laugh. I probably have... You see how many un, unanswered? Yeah, I have I have one thousand nine hundred and twenty five emails un, <laughs> not answered. Uh, but you know, a lot of that spam or stupid stuff. But you know, it's just it's funny. I'd say on any given day, I get about a hundred emails. Yeah, that's I don't <laughs> yeah. want to do that. I don't want to do the email stuff. I know, uh, and I, I don't even want a phone anymore. It's just, like, gotten to that point where, like, ugh, yesterday I forgot my phone, and I was just like, don't matter. I'm just going to leave it and go to work. Yeah. And it's awesome. Nothing happened, you know. Um, let's go on to another question, which is, uh, this is from John Allen. John Allen asks, Justin, do you do much hard surface modeling? What is your preferred 3D software? Well, obviously, your preferred 3D software must be ZBrush, no? No, I never use it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, you're, you're pretty good for your first time. Not too yeah, bad, not too bad. I don't think ZBrush. Um, no, um, I'd say my preferred... Well, my preferred 3D is, is definitely ZBrush. You know, uh, as far as the hard surface goes, I have a lot of um, stuff that I kind of do in ZBrush... Um, that may look like hard surface, but it's not actual like hard surface, hardcore surface modeling. You know, um, there's so many people that are so amazing at that stuff, like uh, Vitaly Bulgarov. Um, there's Gavril. There's uh, Adon. There's you know, there's so many people. Ben Morrow that, that that all do this stuff super awesome and super fast using different programs. Um, I really want to get into doing Moy and using uh, Modo a little bit more. Um, but I'd say that my main staple is ZBrush, and I do a lot of kit bashing. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Star Wars kid, man, you know, so 
it, you know, really looking at those the, the, the sci-fi models and how that stuff came to be and getting inspired out of random pre-made shapes, um, I really, truly enjoy that. It's like, it's literally like playing with adult Legos, and it's just so much fun, uh, especially when other people, you know, when you, you can go online and you can get kit bash kits from other artists and stuff like that. And their shape language is really cool, and they have all their little uh, accoutrements that they've done that you're kind of infusing with what you're coming up with. But my favorite thing to do is is just like, okay, well, this is a hydraulic. What can I turn this hydraulic into that's not a hydraulic? Yeah. You know, that's the fun part for me, where it's just like, oh, yeah, this is a piece for a tank. Watch me turn it into a really cool shape for a spaceship or you know, maybe some sort of crazy alien weapon. Or... And that's what a lot of people did, you know, even before the computers got into the whole film industry, right? Mm-hmm. Like, they would just take uh, a lamppost and, uh, you know, garden hose and such and such and start building something out of that, right? Yeah, because it's, it's all about make-believe, you know? It's like, can you imagine, can you see this in a film or can you see the, you know... The cool thing about our industry is also the the fact of that, yeah, you can draw from your imagination, but when you add real-life reference and real-world knowledge, it makes that design even cooler and even more valid. You know, um, I think that as, as a community, we have a lot more uh, cynical critics out there than ever, uh, and uh, I think that by removing removing any doubt that something could or could not work from their visual library is a definite way, uh, way to go. And uh, the next question is also from Hannah, which I just saw in the chat. Hannah is a woman, <laughs> so I just wanted to <laughs> confirm that. Hi, Hannah. Uh, not that that matters, but it matters to her question because her question says, I always want to know, is it easy to work as a woman in the U.S., in L.A., or Canada in digital art? Or is it a man's, wor- a man's world? Um, I definitely felt like, especially in the live action side of things, when it deals with concept art, character designs, it is more of a man's world. Um, it, it's like it, this it, boys it, club, almost. It is, but I, I feel that I feel like that's that doesn't matter anymore. It's totally going away. It's right? going away, but I mean, it's it's a changing of the guard type scenario, you know. Yeah. Um, I would even say that you know a, a lot of the, the the union stuff that's happening. Who knows if it's going to be here in the next five years? We we I don't know. I mean, it may still be around, but you know, the the rules that govern that kind of stuff might be changing as well. Um, I would say that the best advice I could give anyone, uh, whether you're male or female trying to get into the industry is just get so good. They can't ignore you. Totally. I love it. Uh, that's exactly how, you know, we broke into the industry as well. Cause I'm, you know, I live in Canada and obviously people would rather work with, uh, you know, people that are just down the street or can come in and things like that. But if you do learn enough, the world has no choice but to notice you, so just got to keep learning, right? Yep. Keep uh, going. Keep going to events. Get your name known in a positive way, and the sky's the limit. You know, uh, just keep doing you. Keep keep working on your craft, and you know, work will follow. You know, uh, it's just the best way I can possibly go uh, or to talk about that kind of a subject. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing I just wanted to mention was when I went to school, I don't know about you, uh, Justin, but when I went to school out of 90 some odd people, only seven were girls. So, yeah. you know, if, if that's the people that are in school, who do you think are going to be in the industry? But now... You know, shortly after, the tides have changed big time, haven't they, Masse? Oh, yeah. There's, I think, 80% of my classmates when I was in school were girls. Wow. Yeah. You see that? It's yeah. completely changed. The women are taking over. <laughs> and well, soon I, I... it's going to be like, Justin, you're going to be like complaining. <laughs> People are looking at my butt and stuff as I'm walking around. <laughs> I don't like this feeling. 
<laughs> Let's be fair. I always like that that feeling. <laughs> No, I, I think that also, I think it was either it was either last year or this year. My statistics may be off, but I believe that it's, I think this year is the first year that the female gamers overtook the male gamers in wow. and wow. content. And what's that going to tell you? There's going to be a changing of the guard again, you know, um, especially if it maintains that way. Um, I think it's great. I, I, you know, um, there's a lot, I think there was like a, a whole fiasco with like Gamergate that was going on like a year ago or something. Oh, yes. I remember that. No, I, <laughs> so I ridiculous. It doesn't affect my life at all. You know, not everyone is going to make those changes. It's not going to affect the games that I like to play if I have time to play. Um, but, you know, I think, I think even more diversity is great. It leads to better innovation. Why wouldn't you support that? Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Hey, it's, it's like if they're making games that you don't like. I last time I checked, I didn't. You know, I didn't know that it was mandatory to buy that game. You know, it's just like if you don't like it, then don't buy it. Then they'll stop making those kinds of games. Like, I, you know, I don't know. Um, it, it. I think that it, uh, also it's a different time for toys. With. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, episode seven coming out, and there was no Ray figure immediately. Like she's the, she's the main character. Like you're yeah, not. Yeah, she totally what? stole the whole movie. Oh, absolutely, and I think that's a shame. You know, I think that it's a shame that uh, there's not more Black Widow toys. Um, but you know, the the thing of it is, is a lot of people have to. You know, yeah, they can raise their arms and yell at stuff, but until you own a business. You, you don't look at things in a different way. If the numbers don't support making a Black Widow toy, I understand. Doesn't mean I have to like it, but I understand it, you know. Uh, I don't think that it's a sexist decision. I think it's a purely a numbers game, you know. Because I, I really doubt that there's some, you know, evil villain at the top of a toy company going, no girl toys, you know, like that doesn't make sense to me. Like, I just don't see them. I don't see them really thinking about it that much, uh, or in that regard. But uh, I think that they should still have those options available. But you know, what are you gonna do? You just wait and watch for the the changing of the industry, and it'll happen. It will. Oh, definitely. Like, man, all like look at all that's happening from China. You know, it's like 10 years ago, who would have even thought, you know, all of a sudden all this money has come from China to, you know, make movies and all this great stuff. So many of North American investors now going to China to get that, you know, to get the budget and everything. That's the most mind boggling thing to me, because, you know, when I was growing up, China was quite poor. Anyhow, um, that is, you know, time goes by super fast, especially when you're hanging out with good friends. So uh, (laughs) I hate to say it, but our time's up, everybody. So I want to give a big shout out to all of you that have tuned in and watched this very special Chew Stream with my buddy, Justin Gobyfield. And I want to give another big shout out to my wonderful sidekick, Masei Seki. And uh, the biggest shout out, of course, goes to my man, Justin Gobi Fields. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Thanks. Thanks for having me on, guys. It's always a pleasure to hang out and chat with you guys. Right on. All right, guys. So uh, tune in next time and uh, have a great day. <laughs>